Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today I'm going to show you how to put together an engine block. Today we are going to be going through the process of reassembly on an engine block. This of course is a VR6 engine block from my 98 GTI. Now before you can do any kind of reassembly, of course we have to do our disassembly. In addition to disassembly, we will want to make sure we've taken all of our preliminary measurements to make sure that there's no damage to things like the cylinder bore, crank journals, or the pistons. We're also going to do a visual inspection to make sure we don't see any damage. This block did go to the machine shop for some work. It was hot tanked, which means it was cleaned. The deck was resurfaced and the cylinders were honed. If engine damage was found, you may have to have the cylinders bored to accept a bigger piston, more surface of the deck taken off, and perhaps the crank line board. This was in pretty good shape, so we didn't have to do any of that. Once we've taken care of all that, it's time to start with the crankshaft. We're gonna start by putting new bearings in the block and in the main caps. Be sure to clean the backside surface of the bearing as well as where the bearing rests in the block and on the caps. We're going to also want to make sure that we clean the bearing caps and any mating surface as well. When installing these particular bearings for the crankshaft, the bearings that sit in the engine block have an oil groove in them. The ones that go to the caps do not. If required by the repair manual, we're going to replace any bolts that we need to. These main bolts are torqued to yield, which means when the bolt is properly torqued, it stretches a little bit longer than it is when it comes new. Those kind of bolts are almost always automatic replacements. Before installing the crankshaft, we do want to make sure we make all of our measurements to check our oil clearances. The crankshaft actually rides on a small, thin layer of engine oil and not directly on the bearing. We want to make sure that our oil clearance is correct before going any further. It's also not a bad idea while you have the crankshaft out of the engine to go ahead and measure the journals for the connecting rods. It's not mandatory, but it does make it a little bit easier. Next step is going to be to clean, clean, clean. Using acetone or lacquer thinner is a great way to remove any dirt, any debris from the crankshaft journals and the bearing surfaces. And while not a must, it's a good idea to remove any plastic gauge if you used that. You'll find throughout this process that cleaning is actually the thing that takes the longest. Next, we're going to lube the bearings and the journals. Some people prefer to use regular engine oil. For this one, we're using Redline Engine Assembly Lube. It holds a little bit better and lasts a little bit longer. In addition to lubricating on initial startup, these kind of projects are to prevent rust. And since I'm not 100% sure of exactly when that first key fire is gonna be, I wanted to use something a little thicker than engine oil. Next, it's time to install the crankshaft. Depending on the engine, this may be a part you wanna get a second set of hands for. Slowly lower the crankshaft down into the engine. Be careful not to just drop it. You don't want to cause any damage to the crankshaft or the bearings. Next, we're going to install the thrust washer on this engine. This limits the back and forth movement of the crankshaft. The one that I have here is four parts, two upper and two lower. I'm going to start by installing the two upper ones first. Remember, this engine is upside down, and that can be set in the groove and pushed around to the other side. You want to do that for both of the two top thrust washers. And a quick tip, a little bit of assembly lube will do a great job holding that in place. There are multiple different kinds of thrust washers. Some are actually built into the bearing. This just happens to be how this engine is. Next, we're going to install the bearing caps. At this point, they should be cleaned and have the new bearings installed. If not, go ahead and do that. And we're also going to lube the bearing in the cap. I like to set them all down on the crankshaft and use a rubber mallet to just tap them down. You don't need a lot of force here, just enough to tap them into place. What you want to make sure you don't do is use the bolts to draw the cap down. Next, I'm going to evenly tighten the bolts to about hand tight. You want to make sure that you're not doing one all the way and then the other. You want to tighten the bolts down together. Our first step in our torque on this particular bolt is 30 newton meters. So we'll go ahead and torque all of them to 30 newton meters, starting from the inside and working our way out. Next, we're going to do 180 degrees. That's the stretch part that I talked about earlier. I like to go ahead and mark my bolts for that 180 degree turn, which is half a turn. It's always going to be recommended to use a torque angle gauge to achieve that 180 degrees, but 180 is super easy. And whether I'm using a torque wrench that does angle, a separate angle gauge, or eyeballing it, I always like to put marks on the bolts. That'll allow me to quickly look and make sure I got my half turn. It'll also allow me when I'm done to do a quick recheck. Rechecking 30 newton meters is very easy. It's a little bit more difficult if you're not 100% 
percent sure to put an extra half turn on something, it could result in a severe over torque situation. Once our crankshaft is fully installed, it's time to move on to the pistons. Just like we did with the crankshaft, we want to spend a good amount of time cleaning the pistons. You want to clean the whole surface of the piston. Next, we're going to assemble the pistons and connecting rods. This is something that I had already done previous to this video. We're going to install new bearings, just like the crankshaft. We're going to clean the backside of the bearing and the connecting rod and cap to make sure there's no dirt or debris between the bearing and the cap or connecting rod. After our bearings are installed, we're going to get our new bolts and torque the caps down. This torque is going to be 30 newton meters with no stretch. And this is what we're going to use to measure the oil clearances just like we did on the crankshaft. This is not nearly as important on a stock rebuild or refresh engine as it would be if we were doing a highly modified car, but it's always a good idea to do. This is our last chance to catch any potential issues going down the road, and perhaps one of the parts we're replacing, one of the new parts, is not in perfect condition. It's just that little extra peace of mind. We'll take the measurement of the crankshaft journals, with an outside micrometer, and we'll use our bore gauge again to measure the bore of the connecting rod. The difference between those two is our oil clearance. Next, we're going to move on to our piston rings and measure the ring end gap. This is a tool that makes sure that the piston ring is set properly in the cylinder. If it's not set properly in the cylinder, you'll actually get too big of a reading and can cause problems. The easiest way to install the ring is to put it in and rotate it so it's in the cylinder and then just push it down on the tool. You can also use a piston to be sure that the ring is square inside the cylinder. And we're gonna use a feeler gauge to measure that end gap. If the gap is too small, we'll use a ring filer to grind it down. If the gap is too big, we're actually gonna be looking at getting new rings. Because this is the stock bore size and what are meant to be direct replacement piston rings, everything checks out exactly where we want it to be. On a lot of other applications, they'll actually order rings too big so they can dial in the exact amount of gap that they want. We're gonna do this for the upper ring, the middle ring, and of course the oil control ring, and then do that for each cylinder. It's important to make sure that you're organizing these piston rings based on the cylinder that you measured it in. So as we move forward, when I measure cylinder one, this ring set, I'm gonna set aside and label for cylinder one and continue for the other five cylinders. After we've measured all of the piston rings and made any adjustments to the end gap, it's time to do a quick deburr. This isn't 100% necessary, it's just one of those best practice type tips from a professional engine builder. This also does reduce the chance of scratching a cylinder or let's face it, yourself. After we've deburred the edges of the piston rings, it's a good idea to give them a thorough cleaning. This will remove any bits that may have been left over. Dish soap and hot water work the best for this, but you do wanna make sure that after they're clean, you do a very thorough and immediate job of drying them. These steel rings will rust incredibly fast. And as you clean and dry them, make sure you put them back in the order that they were and stay organized. Next, we're gonna put the rings on the pistons. There's two main ways to do this. One using piston ring pliers. These can work pretty good, and some of the cheaper piston ring pliers work just okay at best. These pliers do take a little bit of finesse to use, so if you have old piston rings, I recommend test driving the ring pliers with the old ones and get a feel of how easy these rings can break with this tool. I'd much rather you break an old ring testing it out than break a new one accidentally. The other way that's not the by the book way, is to roll the piston ring on. This is actually the way that most engine builders do it. I think most engine builders really hate those pliers. It's quick, it's easy, and you actually have less risk of damaging the piston ring. You do wanna make sure that you do not over twist the piston ring though, because it can distort, and you still have the opportunity to break them. Before we put the piston rings on, we wanna make sure that they're in the proper orientation. The piston rings are different widths, so they actually will only go in one place properly. So we know where the oil control ring goes, we know where the middle compression ring goes, and the top ring goes. We wanna make sure that we're looking at the piston rings though. Most of them are labeled with the word up or top, indicating that they face up. After we've put all three rings on the piston, go ahead and put a little bit of oil on it and let it work its way down while you do the other ones. With our pistons ready to go, it's time to go back to the engine block and work on the cylinder bore. We wanna do another thorough cleaning of the cylinder bore with acetone. This is our last shot to get rid of any dirt or debris that may cause an issue with the ring seating. Next, we lubricate it with a little bit of Marvel Mystery Oil. This works really well because it's got some lubricant in it as well as some detergent. So we're doing one final cleaning. When we're doing this step, I recommend using a white towel. It'll show any leftover dirt. So if you do find any leftover dirt, you have the opportunity to go back in with acetone 
clean it again, and then treat it again with Marvel Mystery Oil. And of course, this stuff smells pretty good. Finally, lubricate the cylinder with a bit of engine oil. We want to avoid any drive movement of the piston inside the cylinder. As we round home, it's time to put the piston in the cylinder. Before installing the piston, we want to make sure that the rings are clocked properly. The repair manual for this engine says the ring gaps should be 120 degrees apart. So officially, that's what we'll recommend. I have gotten pro tips of doing them 180, 0, and 180, which means that one gap will be at 6 o'clock, one gap will be at 12 o'clock, and the other gap will be at 6 o'clock. Mr. Wolf, the engine builder that helped me through this process, had mentioned that that's what they do for race engines. Once our rings are properly clocked, we're going to install the piston. This is best done with the proper ring compressor. Now, the VR6 block and bore are at an odd angle to each other, so the standard ring compressors don't really work that well. You can use them, but it's a little bit tricky. It's not just squeezing the rings and tapping it down into the bore. VW, of course, does make a special tool for this that's plastic, and it works average at best. It actually works terribly for me when I was doing the VR6 swap on the Cabriolet. There are companies that do make specialized ring compressors for this application that are supposed to work really well. But I've found that actually doing this by hand is really not that hard. It just takes a little bit longer. You have to go slow, and of course you have to be careful. So if you have the proper tool, use that. If you don't, Installing these pistons by hand can be done. Once you have a piston installed, I like to rotate the crankshaft so that the journal is at the bottom, which means that the piston will be at the very bottom of its travel. Before attaching the connecting rod to the crankshaft, we want to, of course, make sure that our bearing is lubricated, we want to make sure our journal is lubricated, and we want to make sure our bearing is still in its proper place. Next, we're going to lubricate the bearing on the cap and install the cap. We're going to lubricate the threads of the bolt as well as the shoulder of the bolt and the landing area on the cap. Those are the points of the highest stress of the connecting rod. And just like with our main caps, we want to snug these bolts down evenly. We don't want to do one all the way and then the other. Now it's up to you here. You can properly torque this bolt or just snug it up and do them all at once. I like to snug the bolts up and torque them all at once. And of course, follow the manufacturer's recommendation for torquing. For the connecting rods, I'm using ARP bolts. So there's a video that will be coming out soon on exactly how to do that. Be sure to check the description for the link to that video. I'll also try and link it up in the top right corner. After all of your connecting rods are properly torqued, it's time for a visual inspection. Go through, look at all your marks, make sure everything is torqued down properly. I like to rotate the engine around a couple of times and make sure everything moves. And then I'll re-lubricate the cylinders with some engine oil, put a cover on it until I'm ready for the next step. All right, guys, there we have it. The rotating assembly of the block is fully put together. There is, of course, a lot of other parts that need to get installed onto this block. Our next step is going to be installing the cylinder head and timing the engine. If you guys have any questions or comments, you know what to do. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. I always appreciate that. Don't forget, if you want exclusive content, discounts you can't get anywhere else, as well as the VW Audi training manuals for the classes that I teach, check out the crew membership program. A couple other ways you can support the show and the work that I do, check out the Patreon, there's a link down in the description, or use my Amazon link where I get a little kickback off of anything you buy, and it doesn't cost you any money extra. Also, incredible shout out to Mr. Wolf and the folks at NASCAR Technical Institute for letting me come down and use their facility to put together the bottom end of this VR. As a UTI grad, it was fun to go back there and hang out in the lab, and let's face it, that engine lab is way nicer than mine. Be on the lookout for more VR6 engine and white Wookiee videos coming soon. Guys, thanks so much for watching. I love you, and I'll see you next time.